Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. We are continuing our discussion about what the Air Force values in its Air Force officers. We've covered executing the mission, leading airmen, and managing resources. And today, we're moving on to the fourth and final value as described by General Goldfein in his memo and also in AFI 1-2, 3.4. This is how an officer contributes to improving his or her unit. From AFI 1-2, 3.4, it says, Continuous process improvement is a hallmark of highly successful organizations. Wasteful, ineffective, or unsafe ways of doing business cannot be tolerated. Officers must foster a culture of innovation and challenge inefficiencies. Now, Reed, this is an interesting topic of discussion, especially given what's going on in our Air Force right now and actually where the Air Force came from to begin with. The Air Force is an organization that was born from and raised in a culture of innovation. The reality is that the Air Force wouldn't exist at all if people like Billy Mitchell, Hap Arnold, and Curtis LeMay weren't continuously trying to improve upon things if they weren't trying to foster that culture of innovation. It's this culture of innovation that has very recently given birth to now the the Space Force as the sixth branch of the military of the armed forces. And I feel like this has been an especially big topic that has continuously come up over and over again while I've been in the Air Force. I don't know how you feel about it. It definitely has picked up very recently and to the tune of actual allocation of money. That's kind of when you know it's serious is when it's not just something that we hand wave, but we actually put dollars behind it. I don't know if you guys have any of these or access to them, but squadron innovation funds. Have you heard of these SIF funds? Yeah, I've seen a few different ways that those squadron innovation funds have been implemented. Yeah, so down to the most fundamental unit of the Air Force, the squadron, funds are allocated and designated specifically to allow and encourage and in many ways foster this idea of innovation. It does seem that it has picked up lately. Yeah, and in addition to those squadron innovation funds, there are a huge number of other programs and other special duty opportunities and TDYs that airmen, including officers, can go on and take advantage of in order to become better innovators themselves or to help their airmen develop that culture of innovation. In no particular order, here is just a taste of some of the programs that the Air Force currently has going that are focused in on this idea of innovation. Airmen powered by innovation, AFWorks and the Spark Tank, Kessel Run, Education with Industry, National Security Innovation Network, National Science Foundation Innovation Corps, and the Air Force Fellows. So in addition to those different programs and special duty opportunities, there are actual units and installations within the Air Force whose primary mission is innovation. First and foremost, Air Force Materiel Command. There's a major command whose entire job, its only mission, is to innovate and make the Air Force better. Other units, the Air Force Research Lab, the primary lab itself in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but other labs that are sprinkled throughout the United States, the Life Cycle Management Center, the Installation and Mission Support Center, the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies at Maxwell Air Force Base, part of the Air University, Edwards Air Force Base, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Kirtland Air Force Base, Eglin Air Force Base, all of these different units, installations, these programs, these TDYs, All of them are part of this idea of innovation and ultimately improving the unit down at the squadron level. Now, certainly this is not an exhaustive list, and each of these different programs, units, and installations deserve their own episode. Maybe that's something that we can look into bringing some experts on and talking about 
how each of these different programs work, especially as they relate to the training and development of our Air Force officers. But the main point here is to show how seriously the Air Force takes this whole culture of innovation. Now, Reed, it's great to know that the Air Force really takes this seriously and is putting large amounts of money into the idea of innovation. But I think we need to better understand what is truly meant by you know, these buzzwords. And that's really what they are, is buzzwords. What is meant by these buzzwords, culture of innovation and continuous process improvement? What are we talking about when we say improve the unit? What are we looking for? Yeah, no, I think we absolutely do. Because I'll admit this is something that despite its growth, and I do recognize the importance of innovation. I really do. It has gotten to a point where it is start to become a little bit cliche and a little bit trite and almost frustrating. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit here about some experiences I've had that have kind of led me to that point where sometimes change just seemed like it was change for change's sake. But I do think there are some things we can talk about, especially in like the perspective that an officer should bring to a unit, the attitude they must have. And something we absolutely trained to and trained for and looked for and evaluated our students on was their ability to look at a process, a mission, a situation, understand what was going on and figure out how to make things better. You know, just really good problem solving, I guess, is one thing that you could look at it as. Yeah, I think that is really what is at the heart here. You know, at the center of it all, we're looking for officers who are problem solvers and can encourage their people to be problem solvers as well. Yeah, and create a culture of problem solving. I think that's one of the biggest things that we're trying to get out of this. There's, you know, we'll talk about it. There's a time and a place to make things better, but you need to have an attitude of how can this be better? And that culture, it has to be fostered. You can't just say, oh, we care about this. You actually have to put in time and effort and money into making that a reality. Yeah, so really what we're looking for is you know, officers who can think critically, that they're going to, like you said, look at the mission, the process, the set of circumstances, understand the major moving parts, recognize strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, assets, and liabilities. We need them to be able to assess the situation and define the problem. What is the problem? What is it that needs to be solved? And then with that information, they're going to work with their people to develop a set of solutions. Then they have to make a decision. Once they've made that decision, or even better, empower their people to make the decision, then they need to act on that decision. The officer has to lead their people through this process of executing the solution, just as they would lead them through executing the mission, making necessary adjustments along the way. Now that goes back to our previous episode on executing the mission, leading airmen and managing resources. It all ties together. It's just one big never-ending cycle. And in fact, what is it that I've described here? This is the OODA loop, Colin. Amazing. John Boyd wasn't just blowing smoke. This is actually a real thing. It's not just applicable when you're in a jet flying Mach 3 with your hair on fire. It applies while you are down on the ground at your desk, going about your unit, talking to your people, developing, creating, fostering this culture of innovation. You are using the OODA loop. Yeah. Now for our audience who may not be familiar with the OODA loop, it's a system, a way of thinking, a way of problem solving that was developed and made popular by Colonel John Boyd, Air Force legend at this point, where one observes what's going on. They orient. And those are the first two OOs. Observe is, again, gather data, learn, Orient is to adjust and understand the impact of the information coming to you. And then the last two part, the D and the A, decide and act. And this was the problem solving process that I was taught as a student at OTS. We were teaching an eight step problem solving process. Colin, is that what you guys are teaching at ROTC right now? Yeah, we use both. We actually, we teach the OODA loop, the eight step PPSM, practical problem solving method, and also one called APTEC. We don't use it very much. Yeah, which is why I can't remember exactly what AppTech stands for. Yeah, but we teach a method for solving problems. Yeah, and this one has stuck with me the longest, even though I taught the other one for a couple of years. It's OODA to me. That's just what I was taught, what I was raised on, and uh, something I've absolutely used. It's essential that you have a framework 
for understanding problem solving so that you can get better at it. This is something that we do inherently without really even thinking about it, but providing a framework for people to think about it more critically allows them to get better. Where were the places in this process, Colin, that you see people breaking down the most in the OODA loop? Well, let's first take a look at what we're dealing with. So in the observe phase, this is where you're identifying what the problem is. And let's be honest, everybody is really good at identifying what's wrong. There's no shortage of opinions about what is wrong in a Air Force unit at the squadron. Everybody knows what's broken, right? So that's not where things are going to break down because if you know what's wrong, then you can do something about it. It's not in the decide or the act phase because our training as Air Force officers makes us really, really good at making decisions and acting on it. That is something that we train for very specifically to make sure that our officers have the ability to make decisions and act on them. So if it's not in those other three phases, then the whole process has to break down most typically in the orient phase where people are trying to truly assess what's going on, develop solutions that are going to fully address the issue at hand. Why is it that this is the phase that breaks down more than anything else? Well, it's because it takes effort. It takes effort to look at what's going on, think critically about it, fully understand the situation, all the moving parts, all the variables that are involved. It takes time. If you're trying to fully grasp what is going on in a situation, it's going to take time. You have to gather data. You have to make assessments, run surveys, all these things so that you have enough information to help you develop a series of solutions or courses of action that will help you to resolve the problem. And then there's institutional inertia. The way that things have always been done carries some momentum. People don't necessarily like change, especially if the way that things have been done is in their favor. If it's going to change the way that they have to do things, is if it's going to make them feel uncomfortable, then there's going to be resistance against whatever solution you provide, even if it's going to ultimately make things better in the long run. Yeah, I totally agree. Something we would talk about at OTS was getting stuck in the ooh. You know, a little automatopoeia there. It kind of worked really well to describe the student's inability to work through the loop. They'd get stuck in the ooh. It wasn't too often that I knew someone had sorted the observe and orient phase and just were hesitant to make decisions, but that did happen. You know, you'd look them in the eye and you could tell they knew what needed to get done and they understood the importance of doing it, but they just needed that little kick to get over the edge. But you're right. We train to that, to the side and act really well. But getting people to go through the ooh effectively and efficiently, that's a real challenge. And I think that there's an opportunity for improvement within our commissioning sources to direct a little bit more attention to getting through the ooh, to working through the orient phase. I don't think that in ROTC, and you may feel the same way about OTS, I don't think that we spend enough time on helping our officers, our cadets, our future officers get really good at critical thinking, gathering data, and developing solutions from that data. Yeah, we focus a lot on it. Just don't think OTS has enough time. Eight weeks just isn't enough time you know, to get enough reps, but it is something we really worked and trained to a lot. So Colin, what's your take on all this? I got to tell you, I get frustrated with change for change's sake. I'm all for making things better. But something I've wondered is if our culture of innovation and improvement creates so much change that we're actually impeding actual mission accomplishment. Have you experienced anything like that? Or am I just totally out in left field here? No, I think you're definitely on the right track here. One of my biggest frustrations as an officer in the Air Force, has been that my job, not necessarily my assignment, my assigned unit, but my job changes so frequently. So let me just paint a picture here. When I came into the Air Force back in 2011, my first job was working in a, what we call a programming office. I was responsible for developing requirements and projects for the buildup and maintenance of a base. And I did that for about 18 months. My next job 
was to be the construction management OIC or officer in charge. So no longer focused on the programming of a project, but the actual execution of the project itself. But I did that for only about seven months before I deployed. And I was deployed for six months doing programming again with a little bit of construction management. When I came back, I was a squadron section commander and I did that for about five months before I was made a flight commander for the readiness and emergency management flight, which I did that for about eight months until I deployed again for another six months being the engineering flight commander. So in my four years as an officer in the Air Force, I had, I lost count, seven different jobs. The longest one that I held was for 18 months, and that was my very first one. And that was because I was learning how to do everything. But after that, I was changing every six, seven, eight months. And that's not uncommon. It is very normal for officers to come in and be moved from job to job to job, even within the same unit. And what that does is it means that by the time that you learn what your job is, but by the time you get good at it, it's time for you to move on to the next one. So there's not really an opportunity for you to optimize anything that's going on because you've just barely learned how everything works. Plus, it also fosters this idea of if you're going to do something, you got to do it quick because you're going to move positions very soon. And so you get in, you take your first quick look at what's going on. You're like, okay, I got to change something so that I can feel like I've done something here in my specific job or responsibility. And I think that continues all the way up through your development as an officer. You know, you get to squadron command and you're in that job for only two years, sometimes only one if you're a deployed squadron commander. And you got to make some changes because that's what you've been raised in. And so I, I totally hear what you're saying here that there's not very much opportunity for optimization of the unit or the mission or the process. But instead, we're focused on some sort of big uh, revolutionaries or sweeping change that can be done as soon as we get our feet wet in whatever job that we're doing. Yeah, I remember one particular experience where the unit I was in was involved in a change that was so drastic that it broke both units that were involved to the point of mission failure. And I understand that sometimes you have to break things in order to build and to change and to go forward, but you have to bring everyone else along with you, right? A single unit is not an entity, an island in and of itself, right? It's connected to other units, which are connected to other units, right? We're all part of this big machine. And we had changed so drastically and so quickly that we didn't bring any of the other units along with us. I mean, it was impossible to. We just changed. and. The people that were involved in the process were not involved. It was simply thrust upon them. And we led to mission failure. No joke, mission failure. We had a lot of people leave the Air Force. And pretty soon after the leadership involved in this change turned over, the new leaders came in and kind of saw this flaming dumpster fire of an organization that had been left. And they put things back exactly the way they used to be. And then they apologized out loud, these 206s, like, wow, we're really sorry you guys went through this. That's a really big deal. It was. It was. And so I guess, you know, how do we know where those lines are? Because yes, sometimes we do need revolutionary change. We do need to break things in order to really get going in the future. Billy Mitchell, sinking of naval vessels with aircraft. He got essentially court-martialed over that and other related things to his belief that air power was the future and was important. How do we know when we're being a Billy Mitchell and how do we know when we should just sit down, be quiet <laughs> and, you know, and optimize? What are your thoughts on knowing where those lines are? Because as a person going through that experience, it was horrendous. It was violent and uncomfortable and really disenchanting. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, it's a really tough problem, right? How do we know where those lines are? And you know, I did a, another interview earlier today, but one of the things we talked about that is that sometimes being an officer, it means you have to operate in the gray a lot. There's a lot less black and white. And, you know, I've asked, 
you know, an 06 mentor of mine, you know, sir, what do you do when you're not really sure what the right thing is? You're doing your best, but you're not really sure. There is no clear, yes, this is right. No, this is wrong. And this is kind of falls into that category for me. And what he said has really stuck with me. He said, if it's repeatable, if it maintains your reputation, if it's reputable and is transparent, if you can do all of those things as you make this decision, then you're probably doing the right thing. If you think about it, if in any way you have to hide what you're doing from either the people involved, from the leadership above or to the side of you, if you have to hide that in any way, you're not being reputable or not being transparent, that's probably not the right thing to do. If you couldn't repeat the same decision given the same set of circumstances, if you make some sort of exception, you know, to try to treat someone special or something like that, if you can't repeat it, you're probably not doing the right thing. And again, if you're putting the reputation of you or those around you in question, you're probably not doing the right thing. So that was a way to measure, you know, sometimes it's a little simple process improvement. No big deal. Good. Everyone wins. We save some man hours, save some money. Good. But if you're going to have to, you know, really shake things up and it's going to be really challenging and it's going to break some things and sometimes that's good. If it's repeatable, reputable and transparent and if you can have the process be in that place, you're probably doing the right thing. I think that is really excellent advice. I'd never heard it explained that way, but I like it a lot. One of the ways that I typically hear it explained is, is the change sustainable? Sustainable is one of those other buzzwords in the Air Force right now that captures this idea of whatever change or improvement is made, can it persist in the long run? Or is it going to revert back to the original state when you, the officer, you, the leader, move on to your next job, as I was describing earlier. So yeah, that idea of sustainability is really important to the Air Force right now. Yeah. One last thing I would put out here as a good way to innovate or to institute change. We're kind of merging two topics, right? You know, change management as well as innovation. But I think they're kind of related. If possible, and as much as you can, you should encourage those that will be affected by the change to be involved in the process. The military is not a democracy, nor should it be. But if you can involve your people in what this change is, it'll make a massive difference. Absolutely massive difference. Seek their input, be willing to implement it. You know, I've had situations where one of my, you know, the favorite flight commanders ever worked for had identified something that he felt needed to be fixed. He sought his folks' input. We proposed a solution. He didn't like the solution, but he said, I think that's the best one. I would vote for this one. But the bulk of the people said, no, sir, I think we ought to go with this. He took the risk of implementing that idea and it worked out really well. And that was hugely influential to me as a follower and as a future leader to see how much humility it takes to sometimes not be right. You know, to have your people involved in that He recognized he didn't have all the ideas. You know, we are one person, right? Colin, you are one person, I'm one person, but together we can have a much better solution. Another thing to do, if you can, is listen to history. Find a civilian, find maybe an older senior NCO who's been around the block a few times. Maybe this change or this new idea that you've got is just something that's already been done and isn't new at all. And I've avoided a lot of pain that way. You know, hey, I got this idea. What do you think, chief? Oh, well, sir, that was tried, you know, six years ago. And this is the result that you haven't been thinking about. Oh, you know, that's great stuff. So do you have any other ideas of how you can, you know, involve your people or more effectively manage through change and innovation? Yeah, just real quick. I want to emphasize one thing here about using your people. I think that's one of the reasons why the enlisted tend to stay in an assignment much longer than the officers do. Their responsibility is to be the technical expert in their specific job. And with that responsibility, they stay in their assignments longer than the officer does. Not just in the assignment itself, you know, at a unit in a location, but they don't move jobs like I was describing earlier. They'll be in a shop for two, three, four years at a time, getting really, really proficient at that specific job. And so it's critical for you as the officer to engage your enlisted and your civilians, especially your civilians, because 
they're the institutional knowledge. They're the ones that have been there for 20, 30 years in some instances. They've seen you, that new lieutenant, that bright-eyed, bushy-tailed captain with all the bright ideas. They've seen you before, many times over, which is a good thing. It's a bad thing in other circumstances. But what that means is there's nothing new under the sun. They've seen your idea most likely come through before. So it's really important that you engage them like you were saying, Reed, because your people, your enlisted and your civilian personnel have been in that assignment at that location for a lot longer than you have and will continue to be there after you're gone. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning, we are not saying these things in order to squash or you know diminish your desire or willingness to bring something up. Please continue to bring it up. We're just trying to point out some ways you can bring it up in an effective way to actually make real change. Because yes, maybe you do have a good idea. Maybe it is new. Maybe it is the first time ever. And I've been parts of those as well. Not my ideas, but been around when those things happened. And yes, so please bring them up, but let's do it in the right way. You know, Colin, as we talk about all this, something that I continue to think about is what does this look like still? I mean, we've talked about a lot of ideas, but I'm wondering how this is going to be captured on a piece of paper. How is this going to be recorded? How is it going to be measured? And I'm not really sure I know. And again, this is one of those, yeah, I'm sure there are people out there with great ideas and I look forward to seeing what the guidance looks like. But what are your thoughts? What is this going to look like on paper as we move forward and with the new evaluation system that's coming probably pretty shortly? Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that I'm sure when the guidance comes out and we get our first look at the new officer evaluation, that's going to help us much better understand and explain to all of you, our audience, how this all is going to work. But here are some of my thoughts. The Air Force always is going to value some sort of metric with regard to the improvement of the unit. Number of dollars saved, number of man hours saved or reduced, performance or equipment efficiency, some sort of metric is going to be a requirement for measuring the improvement of the unit. But I know that that can only go so far because when we're speaking in that regard, we're talking usually in some sort of way that's related to the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You know, what is the technology that we've leveraged? What is the software or information that we've implemented that has caused this money saved, manpower saved, uptick in performance, you know, sortie generation or accuracy of munitions, projection of air power kind of stuff, right? But there are lots of things that the Air Force does that are not very measurable, especially when it comes to human relationships and the morale and welfare of our airmen, of the people that we're trying to lead and take care of. But there is still a lot of innovation that can be done there in improving people's work-life balance, their understanding and motivation toward the mission. I think we can still be innovators there because, again, it's all about problem solving. It's all about identifying what the issue is, coming up with a set of solutions and carrying it out in a way that improves the unit. And I don't know that that's very measurable. Yeah, it's going to be really curious. I'm not sure what it's going to look like. You know, maybe this is going to be a little bit intangible and, you know, maybe it's trying to capture some of those things that we all know what right looks like. And I put looks in air quotes. Maybe this is going to be one of those ways we can tally up what becomes a quote unquote good officer. But um, I'm really looking forward to it. This is an exciting time. Again, I do think this captures part of the identity of what it means to be an airman. It definitely spoke to me as I was looking at joining the military and joining a service. This idea of continuous improvement, of getting better, of never settling, of excellence. It absolutely spoke to me when I was thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. So pretty exciting about this time. And uh, I guess we'll just have to look forward to the guidance. Yeah, I wish I had better vision into the Pentagon's process and timeline for when that's all going to come out. Maybe there's somebody out there in our audience or Facebook group that can provide a little bit more fidelity, a little bit more explanation of how this is all going to break down. And we'd love to share it with the rest of our audience. 
Well, be careful what you wish for, Colin. I don't think you want, you know, a long-term assignment at the Pentagon as a captain. <laughs> that is certainly true. I, well, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> that might work out for me in my family at the moment, but, and it would certainly help this podcast move forward, but I also don't want the Pentagon owning the podcast. So <laughs> yeah, I'm sure as, you know, hopefully potential future FGOs, you know, the Pentagon lies in our future. Well, Reed, I think that has been a good roundup explanation of what it means to improve the unit, even if we're still a little unsure about how it's going to be captured on the future officer performance report. But even so, it is still something that we value. It's something that every officer needs to be a part of, either being the innovator themselves, being the problem solver, or more importantly, fostering that culture and helping their airmen be problem solvers and taking ownership of improving the unit. We hope that this information has been useful to all of you, our audience, in better understanding what it is that the Air Force values. Again, this has been the fourth value in the list provided by General Godfin in his memo and also that is outlined in AFI 1-2. As a review, we as officers in the Air Force value executing the mission leading airmen, managing resources, and now improving the unit. Our next episode that will come out next week is going to focus on how all of this is built on top of a foundation of impeccable character. We hope that you will join us for that episode. We hope that you will share this information with others that you think it will be useful to. And here's a little invitation. Help us to improve our podcast. Join our Facebook group. Leave us a rating or review. Send us your comments, your suggestions, your questions to airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com or engage us on the social media. And we will do our best to make this podcast better for you, our listening audience. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.